Lord be with you. Good morning. Welcome to our plenary time together. It's good to be here. Please come and find a seat. My name is Kristen Verholst, and I am one of the staff members at the Worship Institute. And it is my deep privilege to lead this conversation together with my new friends around loving our neighbor in and through worship practices. So I am so delighted that we are going to be introduced to Philip and Najla, John and Mark, and especially their communities around the world, their places of home, and we're going to be listening and learning with them and through them about who their neighbors are and see through their eyes in their communities who they are learning to love and learning to welcome, embrace. And I just think these services now that we took part in yesterday and this morning here in this space have so beautifully set up this conversation about living as holy people, living in this hope, living hope that really is a tension, right, between the difficult and the deeply joyful. So I invite you to uh, listen in, open your ears and your hearts to the stories that you're going to hear from our friends, and I really trust this will be a beautiful time of learning together. So thank you to each one of you for being here, and I would just like you now to introduce yourself, tell us who you are, and especially bring us into your place, your home, your community, and who your neighbor is. Philip. My name is Philip McKinley. I come from Dublin in Ireland, and at 6 p.m. today, my island is undergoing a fairly substantial historic moment, which is Brexit. And therefore, the command to love your neighbor on an island that has been divided into two, in two political jurisdictions, one will be exiting out of the European Union, the other will be very fervently remaining. So these are pertinent issues for us, and pertinent, therefore, Ireland's history in the United States of America, Ireland's history in uh, modernity with globalization and now multiculturalism in Ireland, uh, these, this, within the, all that heady mix, uh, I am involved in a gospel choir, the Discovery Gospel Choir, and I can share a little bit about that, and that's very much the context. I'm also a member of the Dublin City of Sanctuary Board. Dublin is a city of sanctuary, and I share a little bit about that. I'm Najla Kassab. I'm a pastor from Lebanon. I'm also the president of the World Communion of Reformed Churches, where I newly have, since 2017, around 100 million neighbors <laughs> around the world. Uh, also, I work uh, in the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon, which is the Presbyterian Church in Syria and Lebanon. I work with the grassroots level. I work with youth, with women, with teachers, with families, and I'm privileged to be on this level where I hear the voice how the church can be really a lively church and I always feel the challenge of the young in our churches to challenge us on that. Who's my neighbor? Really, I have a neighbor who's a Muslim. I grew with that neighbor as a child, studied together. We sing the same songs. We laugh to the same jokes. And this is my neighbor. I also have a new neighbor who lately came to Lebanon. And these are the Syrian refugees, new neighbors who are troubled, have lots of questions, and feel, with, uh, feel the injustice that happened to them. Hi, I'm John. My name is John Azuma. I come from Ghana in West Africa. Uh, and I've been also teaching in Atlanta, Georgia, for a number of years. But I, I just relocated to West Africa, where I am with the University of Ghana, uh, setting up an institute uh, for research in Christianity, Islam, and uh, African traditional religions. But I'm also a pastor uh, with the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, and 
Talking about a neighbor in my context, we have two different kinds of neighbors. First, Ghana is very multi-ethnic. It's a very small country of about 20, uh, 30 million, but we have over 72 different language groups. So linguistically, we are very diverse. And therefore, talking about a neighbor, you are talking about a neighbor who speaks a different tongue and whose heart language is not the same as your heart language. That's the first type of neighbors that we have in Ghana. The second type of neighbors that we have also is Muslims and Christians living together. I was raised up in a Muslim family myself. I consider myself as having double heritage. My Muslim family is my biological and cultural family, and my Christian family is my spiritual family. So these are the type of neighbors that we have in Ghana. Uh, Mark Indigen Akaz. Um, I say hello, you are all of my relatives, and that's par part of the answer I'm going to give. Um, Ojibwe, the language I used, has a dubitative mode, which means, so literally I said you're my relatives, but there's a note of doubt in it. And, uh, and I like to interpret that optimistically as saying, well, let's be relatives. We might as well act that way. That's a good way to be. So, uh, and my name is Mark. Um, it, because indigenous cosmology, broadly speaking, uh, there are many different tribes and many different ways of expressing it. Um, my work as the National Indigenous Anglican Archbishop of Canada means that I work with uh, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of different tribes and languages and cultures, but a family resemblance among the spirituality of those cultures is that you are to treat uh, not only every human being you meet, but uh, the rest of creation in a relational way. Uh, this is how the cosmology works that the family relationships that we experience in our uh, uh, extended families um, are a, a, a picture of how uh, the creator has made the universe and a guide to the way you should be with other people. So in a sense, there isn't a concept of neighbor uh, in this, but the understanding of the goal of every encounter with another human being, certainly, but really with all of creation, is that you create a family relationship with them, and then uh, you would refer to them in the appropriate way. Um, you are my brother, you are my sister, you are my grandfather, you are my grandson, you are my nephew, you are my niece. Um, and so that's the goal. I think that a lot of people don't understand the treaty process here in North America was seen on the European side as a granting of, of land and authority. But indigenous people saw treaties as the making of relatives. So the, the, I, the, uh, the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Well, pretty much everybody. Um, everybody's your, your relative. Oh, thank you, Mark. That, that leads in very nicely to really help us, um, let me just maybe stay with you. So now take us uh, deeply into your worshiping community, your, your um, ministry context, and give us some examples of then how you help um, one another see we're all part of this neighbor and family. I, th I think it's important to say how much Jesus means to the indigenous people of North America. Um, the gospel had a huge impact, even on people who, uh, did not, for various reasons, did not, not become parts of the Christian church. 
The idea really was that Jesus kind of ramped up that whole idea of being a relative. Um, so you see uh, the concepts of being relative uh, entering into Christian worship. Uh, as, as you know, Europeans aren't so uh, friendly. And, um, <laughs> and, and as you know, that lack of friendliness uh, enters into worship from time to time. You may have noticed that once or twice. But anyway, so, um, so a lot of where the relational aspect of things entered into worship experiences that were outside of Sunday worship, which never really was very popular in indigenous communities. We like to gather together to sing in a family style of, of doing things. And uh, this takes some getting used to. So when I entered, I was working with a Navajo congregation and after the service was over, a group of very elderly gentlemen came up and addressed me in Navajo as their maternal grandfather. I laughed and I said, um, well, yeah, you're my grandson, back to them in their language. And, and then later on, uh, the interpreter told me that they were telling me that the relationship of a healer to the patient is that of a maternal grandfather. What they were doing was honoring me by saying that by leading their worship, I had become their maternal grandfather and that I was accorded that kind of respect. I felt ashamed that I made fun of it. So um, you see these sorts of things kind of, uh, uh, they get woven into a Christian understanding, uh, of an idea of, what the act of Jesus' uh, life, death, resurrection, and coming again, how that amplifies and animates the relationship of being a relative, and that's brought into worship. And as I said, just to wrap it up with a bow, what happened is to make that really hap happen in an indigenous way, they had to develop alternative forms of worship than the European style worship that happened Sunday morning. So these became very popular and developed uh, uh, very much. John, take us into your worshiping community and how are you um, in engaging with your neighbor or seeing and, and practicing in your worship this understanding of neighbor? Yeah, we, one of the things that uh, we intentionally uh, do in our worship services is that uh, we try to be very inclusive uh, because of the multi-ethnic, multilingual nature of our society. We are very conscious that there are always going to be people in the church there who speak a different tongue. And so we are deliberately inclusive in the music that we select. We make sure we don't sing from one language throughout the worship service, uh, the medium of worship. Uh, we may sing uh, five, six songs, but they may be in four different languages. Uh, and so we literally embody uh, the Pentecost very much so in our worship services. We speak in different tongues. Uh, because that's how our society is. And we also are very conscious that uh, when Jesus says, I have other sheep that I will bring into the sheepfold, we understand that to mean that one of the things that Jesus requires of us is to make room in our worship services for new people who will come in. And these new people may come in unannounced. And they, when they show up, they are not coming just to sing our songs and enjoy what we have served on the table. They are coming with, a different, with new sets of menus. They are coming with new songs. They are coming not just to make up the numbers on the books, but to actually change the content of the books. And so we, we take that very, very seriously. 
And therefore, we are deliberately inclusive uh, in, 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 in the sort of music that we select. Uh, and we, when we're doing Bible study, for instance, in church, we break up as a congregation into Bible study groups. We encourage people to bring the different Bible translations in their language. Uh, we read the same passage in different languages, and we ask those who speak that language to comment on what that passage says to them. And so we are not just uh, uh, reading one language, but we are learning new insights from the different translations. Because we realize that a term like sin, S-I-N, can be translated in different ways, in different languages. And, and these different translations come with different meanings and different theological kind of impact that it, they bring along. So we learn a lot from each other, not just that we are welcoming, but we are deliberately and intentionally reaching out to want to learn from our neighbors who speak different languages. Thank you. Nashla. Uh, to us, the starting point is to cre create this trust with our neighbor. Because I don't feel, think that a Muslim neighbor would feel comfortable to come to our church just like that. They will feel comfortable to come when, we, when they meet us outside the church, in serving them, in taking care of their needs, in feeling their pain. And this is the start that we discovered as a church. The start does not happen in the church, it happens outside the church. We have started schools, for example, for uh, Syrian children refugees, that are the majority uh, are Muslim children. And while worshiping, you know, in these schools, we use theocentric language. We don't feel, you know, we are lessening anything if we include more speaking about God, because they were, there are many things that they will not understand, but they will grow to understand that. And at the same time, it's a time to, under, to learn about their religion as well. It's not us only teaching them. It's them teaching us as well. And I believe sitting on a round table where we both learn to discover God in our lives. This is why uh, we will not compromise Jesus Christ. But the starting point is to sit comfortably around the table and to see the richness of others and with these children. At the same time, we created a worship service in our churches. One day, where we call it Compassion Sunday. And it's a service that lifts up stories from people around us in all our churches in Lebanon and Syria. And we let the people who are struggling to tell their own story. Many times we think we understand the story, but we don't. So they participate in these worship services. Even the music, you know, we try to include uh, both. I remember in 2010, I was here in the Gen Assembly of the World Communion of Reformed Churches. And all of a sudden, I hear the choir singing Arabic. And I said, like, am I hearing right? But I want to tell you how inviting that was for me to worship. The whole feeling became a, new, a different feeling, even when I know our, uh, English. The same thing with our neighbors. We, need, we are challenged to see how we can really invite them and we have, how both of us can be present in front of God. In this encounter, they are changed, but I think we are changed more. We start to hear ourselves. Sometimes we just throw words. We don't understand what we are talking about. But with such encounters, we, we, they help us to lose, use a language that speaks to them. And this encounter, we don't need to worry about it. Sometimes we worry too much more than God, you know, about our terminology. God is with us in these encounters. And God is le leading that neighbor to come and know him. Thank you. Philip. Well, my context is gospel music, and in Ireland in the last 20 years, there has been an enormous explosion in interest in gospel music. Um, but largely, there are kind of three tectonic plates uh, that have emerged. One is in Northern Ireland, you have a, a whole uh, Northern Irish gospel music scene. Uh, it is largely evangelical, 
um, Calvinist and often uh, linked, for example, with gospel halls, which would be Plymouth Brethren, Sphinglian. And, uh, but there's a whole massive network of artists and groups and small groups connected with that that work together. In the Republic of Ireland then, where I'm from, you have two major branches. One is about 20 years ago, particularly Roman Catholic churches that might have had a folk group, um, evolved or emerged into looking at gospel choirs, and there's been some very successful and dynamic gospel choirs that emerged from that. Some of the Protestant churches, I'm Anglican or Episcopalian Church of Ireland, uh, so our choir emer emerged out of a Church of Ireland church in an inner city part of Dublin City. Um, and uh, so th this has been very transformative, and there's now festivals and networks and training seminars and all sorts of things that work on that dimension. But then outside of town, in the industrial estates and uh, above shops and so on, you have a massive growth in particularly African evangelical charismatic and Pentecostal churches, and s some South American as well, and Asian. Um, and with this, now we have this explosion, the redeemed Christian Church of God, Mountain of Fire and Miracles Ministries, Christ Al Apostolic Church, uh, Cherubim and Seraphim, and a huge uh, development of gospel artists and gospel musicians drawing on uh, South, South African traditions or Congolese traditions or Nigerian or West African traditions. Uh, at the moment, there is a kind of recognition of all three existing, but not the kind of loving your neighbor structures that we really need to, to build. The choir I'm part of, uh, Discovery, envisages itself as a kind of hinge and a bridge to try and see how we can uh, interact and go to both uh, kind of festivals and both training seminars and, and be involved in both sets of networks. But, um, but I mean, I'm often reminded of the famous words of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who said the most segregated time of the week is 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Uh, so these are challenges for us, and we're a divided island, and all our immensely complex religious history doesn't help uh, in any of that. Uh, so that's maybe one of our challenges today. Yeah, and maybe let's just stay right there on those challenges. So it is, it is easy to say, yes, love our neighbors, and perhaps there are certain things we can do that are relatively easy, but there's also many difficulties in loving our neighbors. So could we go there now and be willing to share some stories where it has been very difficult in your community to do that, um, yeah, deep love mm. of the other? Well, if I even say about Ireland's relationship with gospel music, there was a f famous um, ethnomusicologist, Professor Willie Ruff from Yale University, and he had a very controversial claim that gospel music is Gaelic, is Irish and Scots and Celtic. Um, and this was in about 2003, and, and he, he, had, he had got this claim from Dizzy, Dizzy Gillespie. I think it's largely been discredited now, <laughs> but he, caused uh, imaginations to flourish, and uh, conferences were organized and all sorts of different things, and certainly, I mean, if you take two phenomenally significant uh, gospel music songs, Amazing Grace and Rock of Ages. Amazing Grace, written by John Newton, he was on the North Atlantic um, Slave Triangle, uh, imprisoned in Sierra Leone, came to the United States of America, his ship, the Greyhound, coming back across the Atlantic to come back to the British Isles, hits the storm, and eventually it manages to splutter its way to where? Ireland. And it comes to Loch Swilly in Donegal, and this, he attends a church, he goes to St. Columbus Cathedral in, in Derry, and this he accredits as being part of just trying to understand and encapsulate what happened to him in that amazing grace when a wretch like him was saved. Rock of Ages, uh, written by um, Augustus Montague Toplady. Born of Irish parents, he was an Englishman, he came back to Ireland, and that was his famous uh, faith conversion experience was, was in Ireland. Uh, so, in trying to understand why gospel music has landed so well, we've had to kind of dig deep into our history. But another part of our history is to look at what happened when the Irish came to the United States of America. And uh, this is a very complex history. And on one level, um, the interaction with African-American communities uh, led, for example, to the, uh, the banjo being part now of Irish traditional music and, and used in Ireland, but that's an African instrument that went to, went to America and then came back to Ireland. 
Uh, and where these points of fusion, and wh whether they were healthy points of fusion or unhealthy points of fusion, this is something that we Irish are trying to unpack as we speak. I mean, I read statistically 38% uh, of African Americans, according to uh, a genetic research, have some Irish genes. Uh, Muhammad Ali came to Ireland, there's a plaque for Muhammad Ali. We have the Barack Obama uh, Plaza in the center of Ireland. There was a number one hit in Ireland called, there's no one as Irish as Barack Obama. <laughs> Number one. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If the, is that cultural appropriation or? Uh, I'm not going to sing my song. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can get the words on the screen. We can do the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> but actually, that that uh, that. It opened a whole world. For example, Frederick Douglass was invited to Ireland in 1845 by Daniel O'Connell, the, the great father of our Catholic emancipation, and linking the emancipation movements when Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement were singing, We Shall Overcome in the United States of America. Irish people and John Hume and the civil rights movement in Derry was singing, We Shall Overcome. Uh, during the Irish Famine, when one million people from 1845 to 1847 starved to death in Ireland, and another two million came here and came around the world, leading to a diaspora of 70 million people, the uh, First Nations Choctaw tribe donated money, which they say is now $20,000 uh, in today's money to the Irish people. And there is a commemorative plaque, uh, a whole commemorative park called kindred spirits, how in our hour of need we were uh, saved and assisted in this way. So on the one hand there is this narrative of immense solidarity and that's built right into the deepest fabric of gospel music and why gospel music has landed so well and so popularly in Ireland. But there is another narrative, uh, there's a famous book, How the Irish Became White. And uh, this uncovers very difficult information, uh, difficult about our role in the police services and the prison services, the NYPD Irish cop, um, and uh, even the role of the Irish in the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, all this has to be tempered uh, at the same time the minstrel tradition was almost uh, exclusively an Irish, people of Irish descent so all this is sort of painful past. The minute you step into gospel music, you sing these songs of protest, these songs of freedom, the songs from the book of Exodus, you are going deep into painful places about who am I? And I'm going into my family history and my sending off my DNA coding to see how Mongolian I am and all the various things that come back. But that gospel music, it heals. It provokes, it is the sound of essentially the North Atlantic slave trade in many ways. So we're st I'm stepping on very difficult, powerful, but ultimately transformative ground when I sing it. Nashla. Yes, challenges relating to our neighbors in worship. I think in the context of the Middle East as a reformed church, Inviting the neighbors to come in, they are the Middle Easterners, and we worship in a Western way. And I think the challenge comes from our churches to accept to change. Because many times we think that we are destroying our heritage if we change the way we worship, the music that we use it. Even the body language, you know, the Middle Easterners, they like to speak with their bodies, but when they are in church, uh, they stand still. So, so uh, there, is, there is very Presbyterian, proper. <laughs> and, and you know, it's, it's two cultures. So when these people come out, come from outside our church and they have used the drums, they like to, to move, you know. And here you are in this church, they don't know how to behave sometimes. And this is the struggle with the, even young people, how we reform our worship. For sure, Historically, mission had a different understanding. And the missionaries, I want to say, 
they did a good job in reaching out, but for sure the missionaries, they carried the hymns and the worship of the West into the congregations. Well, this has a good side because I can go around the world and sing the same hymn. But the, the bad side is that we lost our culture in our worship. And this is where the young people, you know, the way they, the music they hear outside the church and inside the church is, is totally different. Reform, you know, is a challenge for us as churches. Because at the end, what speaks to people? Does this worship speak to people? I have one of our professors, he said, Najla, the missionaries have been here since 1823. Don't you think people should have been accustomed to that? No, not when they hear a beat. <laughs> so it is, it is this challenge that, that we want these neighbors to come in and to come as Middle Easterners with the culture. And we need to worship as Middle Easterners. I think this is one of our challenges. And this is voiced with the young people in our churches. That uh, this is why we changed the style of worship in our youth uh, group meetings or women's group or anything to relate more to our culture. How to do this bridge is still a challenge and not to feel like, you know, we are abandoning our reformed identity. We, we need to keep pressing on how our worship speaks and changes lives. John. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I am very familiar with the, with the Irish claim that Jesus is Irish, but I, I never heard of Barack Obama and, uh, and, and even gospel music. Well, he's Middle Eastern. He's Middle Eastern, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but coming back, uh, seriously speaking about uh, the challenges that we have in, in Ghana, as I said earlier, the, gospel, the, the kind of music that we sing in church and uh, even the way we do our Bible studies and try to be welcoming to people, uh, it has its challenges because one of the gifts that the missionary Christianity gave to the church in Africa and I would say in the non-Western world, is the Bible in the mother tongue. It's the translation of the scriptures into the mother tongue. That was a huge gift. And uh, it, has, it is what explains in large measure the explosion of Christianity in Africa. Because people could hear the mysteries of God literally being declared to them in their mother tongue. Uh, and that made a huge difference. And so that was a big gift. But what it also did is it kind of, kind of reinforced ethnocentrism in worship. And we become very exclusivist because, of course, Jesus speaks only my language. Uh, and, and therefore, you, you begin to have those kinds of challenges when you want to be inclusive, uh, to include other tongues, to include other tribes, to include other uh, uh, cultures in the worship setting. And, and especially in Ghana where, as I said earlier, you have about 72 uh, different language groups, uh, and yet within that there are always going to be some dominant language groups. And so if you are from the dominant, one of the dominant language groups, you almost don't see the need to speak another language, even to include other people. And, and we have had those challenges in uh, some of our worship services that some people just resist and they're like, well, everybody speaks this language. If you live here, you have to speak this language. Uh, how come that you can speak the language in the market, you can speak the language in the in, in, in office, and yet when you come to church, you don't want to speak the same language. And, and you, we have those challenges, but of course, Using the language in the commercial setting or using the language in the official setting is very different from using the language in a worship setting. Where I'm coming to connect with God, to connect with the supernatural from my heart and from my head. It's very, very different. And also even the language of the, of, from the pulpit, the theological terms and, and nuances therein, 
It's not everybody who can unpack that simply with the language that is spoken in the street. So we are very, very, in, we are very intentional, but we come across these kinds of challenges to try to be as inclusive as we can. Thank you. Mark? Thank you. I would just say quickly that uh, the Bible has had the same kind of impact on indigenous peoples and the various tribes. We are also have that kind of impact. I think one of the things that's important to say is that um, institutional Christianity, which had a colonial agenda, and meaning that usually um, it said you have to become civilized, you have to become like us before we tell you the good news. And so that it was based on an idea that indigenous people didn't have the capacity to hear the good news until they became a Western. And this institutional Christianity with its civilizing agenda uh, existed alongside a, 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 an underground kind of indigenous uh, understanding of Christian faith in which the Christian message became a way of resisting colonization. And this is something that's only beginning to be uh, recognized and understood by anthropologists, and they're starting to show some interest in it. But the, the gospel message allowed indigenous people to accept the things that they liked in Western culture and to keep the things out that they didn't. And so the gospel message was a form of resistance, but it, it existed side by side, institutional colonial Christianity, and so it wasn't really mentioned. The missionaries and the missiologists back then um, basically just said, well, these people don't get it. And, um, but the people did get it, and uh, so uh, the, the gospel had a huge uh, impact, and we could say a lot more about that. But what happened, um, again, um, indigenous religious practice was outlawed until uh, roughly 1960 in Canada and the United States. You could go to jail for um, expressing uh, even your Christian faith in an indigenous way. So what happened is that um, indigenous the indigenous uh, church, the indigenous expression of Christianity, went underground in the practice of hymn singing, uh, which spread all across, uh, all across the land. And uh, still today, if you go into remote parts, especially of Canada, you will find that um, on Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, if you listen to the radio, if you're traveling up in northern Ontario, you will hear people singing gospel hymns in their language. Um, and so uh, the Christian faith has been a way of accepting many things. And so uh, uh, we s say in Canada that there are a lot of Anglocostals or uh, Pentlicans. And, uh, um, and, and th that's because... Uh, you know, I mean, imagine these stuffy Anglicans uh, becoming Pentecostal. It, it, that's what's happening up in our communities. Um, and the uh, same thing is going on in many parts. Uh, you have Episcopostals here in the United States. So, but uh, this, uh, this is a, a very indigenous way of taking what you like, making it your own, and and integrating it, and the hymn singing tradition was the vehicle for that, that is still the vehicle for that, that allowed um, them to become neighbors to um, non-indigenous people and, um, and, and, and to accept the gospel in a way that did not destroy their humanity. That was really the aspect of it. Now, one last thing. Uh, today, the, the other thing that has developed among us, particularly in the Anglican uh, expressions of it, is um, trying, uh, Western ways of doing business have been uh, kind of thrust upon our communities. So um, the missionaries said, well, here's how you do business, here's how you do worship. That kind of di dichotomy doesn't exist in an indigenous mind. So we have begun to uh, read the gospel 
as the opening moment of any time we gather for whatever purpose. And that practice of reading the gospel three times and engaging it three times and encountering it three times has become kind of the bedrock of our coming together. The other aspect of it that I think is important and relative, relevant to this conversation is that it allows us to hear from different perspectives. Uh, we oftentimes uh, read the gospel with someone who isn't Christian in the room and we listen to what they have to say. Um, we say that Jesus has placed the gospel in the center of our sacred circle, meaning that we believe that there are aspects of our culture that Jesus has accepted and affirmed. There are other aspects of our culture that Jesus has challenged and said no to. We understand that as well, but what we are trying to, to say is to, to put it in a worship, to put everything that we do in a worshipful context is the heart of what we do. We see that as a cultural imperative and one of the ways that we resist neo-colonialism, which is just as deadly as the historic colonialism. So uh, that, that, that sums it up. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you so much. This has been wonderful to hear um, more about your place. And I wonder, you all have the opportunity to do a lot of travel and visit other communities. And in that travel, and for those too at this conference, it's an opportunity to get a different perspective. As you go back to your own homes, how has um, being exposed in different places helped you to see and recognize your neighbor in new ways. And I wonder specifically then, how does that challenge you to pray differently in worship? So I wonder if we might just reflect a little bit on the practice of prayer. And as we think about our neighbor, as you um, kind of bump up against a new way of seeing the other, how, how does that impact how we pray, um, sing our prayers, um, any, any thoughts? Any one of you, feel free to, to jump in. Well, Ireland has a very strong pilgrimage tradition and a very strong tradition of holy wells and holy sites. And uh, we have saints in every single townland in the whole of Ireland, 95% of whom have not been canonized by the Roman Catholic Church. So they're, they're really local saints. And with it, you've that huge prayer tradition that is connected in some ways, I mean, they talk today about Celtic spirituality, which is a very broad brush, and I'm not always sure what exactly people are meaning, um, but uh, there is something about uh, the natural world in the Irish mind that is, is of vital significance, and one of the things, all the saints have incredible legends of healing, and um, I mean, St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland, so there's no snakes um, today unless you go to a pet store. Um, in fact, I mean, it's been, you know, today we've heard that Barack Obama is Irish, Jesus was Irish is another claim. I'm gonna make a third very controversial claim. Is this okay? I've, st I, I, I've started, so I might as well finish. <laughs> yes. Christopher Columbus ain't nothing on the Irish. In the 10th century, St. Brendan the Navigator went from Crookhaven in West Cork, and it was a work of God because he was carried on a whale across the Atlantic Ocean, up to Iceland, up to Greenland, and landed and occupied and moved to Labrador in North America. 10th century. So there we are. <laughs> <laughs> but th there, are, there are resources. I mean, one of the things, again, migration and immigration in Ireland and our historic, I mean, Ireland gave to the world a word called sectarianism. So here racism, here casteism, and you can translate it to a certain extent to sectarianism in Ireland. Um, 
But there are deep resources within our ancient prayer tradition that give us incredible resources for welcoming the stranger, for loving the neighbor. We are an island out in the Atlantic Ocean, and we are seafaring people, and all of our, uh, from the Vikings to the Fearbogs to the Celts to the Normans to the British, my name is Philip McKinley Machfionlech in Irish, which means the son of the fair-haired warrior. And our people came from Scotland to Ireland, and indeed the, the, the Scots, Scots were an Irish tribe that went from Ireland to Scotland. My people and the son of the fair-haired warrior were the Vikings that came to Scotland, that came from Scotland to Ireland. And one of my ancestors, uh, part of my family tree, moved to the United States of America, and their son became the 25th president of the United States of America. So all of that movement and colonization and being colonized and migration, it's so deep, you cannot look at our island nation. Um, and there's very healthy things with islands and there's, there can be unhealthy things with islands. Uh, islands can be inward looking. Uh, so I think coming here, I've learned a huge amount, but I can re resonate, you know, what is it something of our ancient roots, our ancient wisdom that can also guide the complexities of modern globalization and uh, the, you know, e f cheap global travel and all the rest that has affected and changed demographically Ireland today. There are things I will not take with me back home. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, I think, you know, with the exposure to worship and prayers, you know, one of our, my professors used to say, and especially as a person in the reform tradition, uh, this continual reformation in, in worship, that many times we end up worshiping from our necks up. And, and I've learned through my encounter in my travel and through encounter with other churches, the need to include our bodies in worship. I think the reformation was too radical. Uh, in changes that we can, you know, it, it shapes our spirituality movements. And I could see this morning how this has shaped our spirituality in that. Another thing that I have learned, when people come and tell you about their suffering, I believe the strongest form of worship is silence. When our pain meets their pain, and sometimes we feel we don't have the words to speak to their I think we miss silence in our churches. I know in my church, if there are a few minutes of silence, everybody becomes restless. But this is a, this is a practice that's, that in, uh, you know, enriches this encounter with, with God in our, in our churches. And I believe we, uh, we need to think more about it and, and to include about it. Also, you know, including the young in our worship. We should be open and trust that God is using them to revive the church. In my context, many times, there are people who think that, oh, they can do anything outside the formal worship service. But where are our youth in, into this? I go to Africa, and the youth teach me a lot about how you, they shape worship, how they give, give new life into worship. And we need to be, have this humbleness to hear the voice of God through our young people in our uh, worship service. Many times we don't want to change in that and thinking that we lose our identity. Uh, at the end, our worship is in the hands of God. God leads us. It's not being a Presbyterian or, or it's God leading us to come closer, to know him closer, to know God's power in a different way. Yeah, for me, in my travels, and I studied in the UK, I spent quite a number of years in the UK, and I also lived here in the United States for close to a decade plus. And uh, one of the things that I have learned in these travels is that it kind of makes me even want to connect more with my own uh, culture, my own mother tongue, and my own uh, 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 values, it's, it's, it's a strange thing that the, the, the more you are uprooted from your, from, your, from your context, the more you feel nostalgic about it. 
And so, my, when I was in the UK and even here in the United States, I, I would pray more in my local language than I did in Ghana. Uh, and there is something there that is also maybe uh, speaking to us as churches in North America. There are a lot of immigrant communities around us. Uh, one of the things we do in Ghana to include people who are neighbors is to do, have two, two services, uh, two different services. Uh, in many of the places in Accra, which has become very urbanized, uh, the churches, the Presbyterian churches in particular, uh, the Methodist churches, they have started adopting this two-service model. In the morning, they have service in English, and in the mid-morning service, they have in the local language. Uh, because of migration into the urban centers, people come from all different tribes, and English becomes now the, the lingua franca for many of these young people. The Pentecostal charismatic churches tapped into that, and they grew phenomenally in, 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 in the urban centers in, in, in West Africa. Because the, the traditional mainland churches stuck to the vernacular, and these Pentecostal churches, charismatic churches, started using English. And you have these young, educated, mobile people who come into the urban centers looking for jobs, and they don't speak the local language of the area, but they can be able to worship in English, at least. And so uh, these dual services have been very, very helpful in including people. And I wonder, uh, when I was in Atlanta, I used to pastor an immigrant Ghanaian church. Uh, these are Ghanaians who live in Atlanta. They, have, uh, they speak English very, very well. They, are into, they work in all kinds of sectors. But on the Sunday, they want to worship in their language. They want to worship in their mother tongue. Is there a place in the Presbyterian churches in the United States, in the other churches here, to even just make room, give space for immigrants to worship there? It could be early morning, it could be late afternoon, to just use the premises to worship in their mother language. That, I think, is one of the ways that we can include people uh, in our services, worship services also. Uh, thank you. Um, it's been my privilege to uh, uh, work in our indigenous churches for over 40 years. So uh, I, it, especially uh, when I started out as a, as, as a, as a young uh, pastor, I would uh, go into the church, I would get there usually half hour early or, or so, and usually there would be three or four elders there um, leaning over and praying in their language. And uh, it was a, such a powerful, powerful thing to see them. Uh, they, would, they would pray out loud but quietly and uh, they, would, uh, they, they were such an inspiration to me. And um, so I flew up north to a, a congregation on, on, uh, in, on the uh, uh, shore of Hudson Bay, uh, quite far north, and a place that didn't have any cell service. And I walked into the church about a half an hour early, and I saw uh, three elders hunched over, and I, I just said, oh, uh, thank you, Jesus. And uh, I was so happy. But I, as I got up to them, they were all looking at their their smartphones, um, and, and uh, so there's a way in which culture comes in that's not too good. So, but having said that, uh, I think, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, indigenous uh, culture really tries to uh, bring things in. I, I was in Fiji uh, uh, a, a week ago, and I went to an Anglican service there. It was very high church Anglican. Uh, the, um, it was, uh, the hymns were in Fijian, but also uh, they did a lot of uh, what you would call a, a, a really hyper-evangelical hymns, um, and which I'm familiar. We, we do the same thing. We kind of mix high church with, 
with uh, Pentecostalism and that, that sort of thing. And so there is this uh, way in which um, if it's good and, it, and they like it, uh, it, it comes in. And as you go way far in the north among the Inuit people, you will find uh, um, a lot of the hymns that um, you find in charismatic churches and the, a lot of the choruses. Uh, they have migrated up there and they're found in the context of uh, uh, denominational churches and churches like the Anglican Church. So uh, that's an indigenous way of, of incorporating things that they like. And I think that they, um, you know, our, our people are kind of reserved in one way, but in another way they like, they like hymns that express a lot of emotion. And that, um, it's, it's hard for people to understand, but just to finish it up. So in an indigenous context, generally, um, uh, performing something th accurately, musically, is not as Im important to people as the emotion that's brought to it. And so people will sing horrible stuff. I mean, it's just awful, and everybody will praise God and thank God for it uh, because, because the idea is that they have expressed themselves um, and that, that's, that's another way. So st stuff comes in, it, it's barely, you know, you can barely recognize it, but, but if it's done with emotion, uh, thanks be to God. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will you please join me in thanking our panelists? We're so grateful to hear from them, and we are going to now, and I'm going to invite Najla to share a story of a song, and singing our neighbor's song is one of a, a powerful way we can all love deeply yeah. our neighbor. So Najla is going to tell you the story behind the song, which you should have received when you walked in, and we'll use that as our parting blessing. Yes. Najla. Well, this hymn was written by a person known as Ziad Samuel Sruji, who was in Palestine, had to move to Lebanon, and then had to leave Lebanon and go to the US. Living this struggle of lo losing his house and being as a refugee in several places. He settled now. The words say, Anta azimun, azimun ya Allah, azimun fi mahabbatika, azimun fi amanatika, azimun fi tahririka, we use this hymn as we close our prayers usually with women, when everyone shares her story. And then we all sing together, Lord, we trust that you are great in your love, in your faithfulness, in your liberation, and in your healing. And this hymn is shared by, with everybody in the Middle East. It's hard to live in the Middle East without being this song, this song is your song. Lord, we need liberation, we need healing. Let's make this prayer where all come together. Sing as you can.
Salam.